The Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce runs a public lecture programme exploring contemporary issues. Teachers TV has access to these lectures and today we bring you the full talk by Nobel Peace Prize winner and international conservationist Professor Wangari Mathai. Wangari is most famous for being the woman who planted a million trees in Africa. Tonight she talks about her journey from a small rural home in Kenya to the international stage where she champions conservation, democracy and peace through her work in the Greenbelt movement. We've sent some teachers to listen to her and we'll hear their responses after the lecture. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you who have uh, given me the privilege and the honor to come here tonight and share some thoughts with you. Now, when the Nobel Committee uh, decided to award the 2004 <coughs> prize to the environment, it was sending a very important and a very historic message. And the message was, that we live on a planet that has limited resources, but the population of the human species continues to increase. We need to learn, therefore, to manage these resources responsibly, accountably, and we need to learn to share them more equitably. In order to be able to do that, we need to govern ourselves through political systems that allow for the respect for the rule of law, for the respect of human rights, to embrace the diversity that is the phenomenon of the human species, wherever we are. That if we did so, we would be more likely to preempt many of the reasons or the causes of the conflicts that we engage in as human, as members of the human family. And this is true whether it is a situation like we have in Kenya where we fight sometimes over the watering hole because we want our animals to get water and we don't want any other animals to come because there is not enough water for all the animals, or fighting over grazing ground because we have overgrazed certain areas and we are now scrubbing for the little space that is left still green. Or we are fighting over rivers that we are trying to divert because we want to do irrigation upstream and are not very much concerned about the people downstream. But it is also possible to find the same kind of struggle for resources in conflicts such as we find in the Fu, or that some of the conflicts we find in the Middle East. If we look around, we can find these conflicts everywhere. Sometimes they take the form of local violence, but sometimes they can uh, accelerate into wars. So the Norwegian Nobel Committee therefore was trying to challenge us to rethink our concept of peace and security, to see if we cannot expand that concept to include the need to manage the resources more responsibly and the need to share these resources more accountably and therefore <clears throat> expand the concept of governance that allows that to be exercised. We had been doing that for many years, and I'm sure many of you may be involved in that work. Certainly people who have been working on human rights issues, people who have been working on women rights issues, or people who have been working on environmental issues knew this, but they could not have made the same statement and with the same uh, mandate and force as the Norwegian Nobel Committee. So I hope that this message will resonate with as many people as possible, with as many governments and development institutions as possible. 
Now, when I started the Green Belt Movement in the um, mid-70s, I was not thinking of the Nobel Peace Prize. What was on my mind at that time were several things that converged. And one of them was the fact that in, um, in 1960, I had the rare privilege of being part of a, a, a group of students from Kenya who came to the United States of America thanks to uh, then Senator uh, John Kennedy, who had gotten together with some of his uh, uh, politicians, like uh, Martin Luther King, like Marshall Th uh, Thurgood, like uh, Andrew Young, and others, to try to open up to America the newly emerging uh, states that we are just coming of, out of the colonial period. And he felt that by reaching out to uh, Africa, this would be a good gesture. And one way to do it is to encourage students from Africa, from Kenya in this particular case, to America. And I happened to be one of about 300 that actually came in one, at one go and landed in New York and were sent in many uh, institutions in the United States of America. And I found myself in a small town, which many people cannot find in the map, called Atchison, Kansas. And there I spent four years, uh, wonderful years, during the times of the struggle for uh, human rights in America, especially for the black people, the civil rights movement. And therefore, I saw what was happening with Martin Luther King and all the issues that we know about. And that really influenced me a lot and taught me a lot about human rights, freedom, uh, and the need to work for it and to fight for it. The other inspiration, I would say, was uh, from my work. When I left the United States, I went and joined the University of Nairobi, and I joined the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, and I immediately got into research. And one of the areas that I wanted to make a contribution in was an area of um, animal diseases. One of the diseases that was economically very important in our country at that time was East Coast fever. It still is, actually. It's a disease that is transmitted by ticks from one cattle to another when they suck blood. And I wanted to see uh, or to contribute uh, by establishing how prevalent the disease was uh, or the parasite was in the ticks. So I would go out into the countryside and collect ticks from the animals, randomly, a very unglamorous exercise. <laughs> uh, and then I would uh, cut the slivery glands and try to see how many of these ticks are actually infected with the parasite. In the course of my doing that work, I observed that during the rainy seasons, most of the rivers would be brown with the silt. And I started asking myself the question, why was, where was this silt coming from? And this, I asked myself, because when I was a child, I grew up in a very pristine environment, where rivers were fast and they were clean. They are full of trouts, and we know that rivers that have trout are clean and they are fast flowing. So I started understanding that upstream on the mountains, deforestation had been going on intensively. And that some of these areas were completely bare, but some had been replanted with exotic species, especially of pines and eucalyptus. And these monoculture plantations had lost the capacity of the indigenous forest of receiving rainwater and retaining that water and allowing that water to seep into the underground to replenish the underground water reservoirs. So the water, much of the water was, uh, rainwater was flowing, fast flowing downstream and carrying with it a lot of uh, silt. So that kind of triggered my mind. The other inspiration that I had 
was that during the mid-70s, the United Nations decided to have the very first women's conference in Mexico, in Mexico City. This was the conference that declared the very first women's decade. And so people, women all over the world were preparing. And so, so in Kenya, we were preparing. And as we prepared, all women of all sectors met under the umbrella of the National Council of Women of Kenya. I went there to represent the Kenya Association of University Women. And I was taking there some concerns I had about being a woman in the university and not receiving the same terms of service as my male colleagues. Now I was having a problem with that. So I took it to this forum. But when I went there, I realized that women from the rural areas were talking a different language. They were talking about needing clean drinking water, food, income, and energy, which was mainly firewood. They said these are the issues that should be discussed in Mexico as far as we women in Kenya are concerned. I listened to those women, and eventually I kind of forgot my own agenda, and started following the agenda of these women. Now, for me, I never went to Mexico, but I know people that did go to Mexico said that in Mexico, water had been identified as a major concern, especially for the rural populations. Water is still a major concern for most of us. But as I was left behind with the women, and I kept listening to their issues, I suggested to them, why don't we plant trees? I don't know why I picked on the tree, but it was actually a magic symbol, because eventually it became a wonderful way to teach people. Because planting a tree is something that is easy. Anybody can do it. Anybody can dig a hole and put a tree inside and water it and take care of it and make sure it survives. So it, was, it became a very wonderful uh, tool for me to teach and to take action. And so I told the women, let's plant trees. And they said, we don't know how to plant trees. And I said, well, I don't know either, but we can ask the foresters. So I went to the chief conservator of forests. And I said, at that time, there were 15 million, about 15 million Kenyans. And I said, I want us to plant a tree for every Kenyan. So I, I told the conservator of forests, I need 15 million trees. <laughs> and he said, you can have all the trees you want. So I went and organized the women, and I told them we can go and collect trees from the forester free of charge. After some time, the forester had to withdraw <laughs> because we were collecting too many trees. He said, you are collecting too many trees. I went to him and I said, you said we could collect all the trees we want, and we want 15 million. I said, he said, I didn't think you were serious. <laughs> so we were serious. And so uh, we decided, actually, that maybe we should produce our own seedlings ourselves. The other reason we decided that was that we were conscious of the need to reintroduce local biodiversity, which was fast disappearing. But the foresters were actually planting exotic species. They were managing the monocultures, especially in the forests, in the gazetted forests. And so we asked the foresters to come and help us understand how you plant trees. When they came, they were very good, but they were very complicated. The, the techniques, the approach, the language was so complicated that the women said, we don't follow them. I said, don't worry, professionals are like that. <laughs> And so we decided that with the little knowledge we had gathered, and the fact that these women are the ones who grow food, they deal with seeds or food crops. 
So we told them, if you, since you deal with the seeds, even tree seeds are the same as the seeds of food crops. You just have to learn to identify when the trees go in flower and you follow the trees, you follow the flowers when they are ripe, when the fruits come, when they eventually uh, give you, can give you seeds. Some of the seeds will be propagated by the winds they learned. They also eventually learned some of the fruits have to be eaten by domestic animals so that they go through the digestive system be before they can germinate. Some have to be eaten by birds, and wherever the birds perch and do their own thing, there the seeds will germinate. So they actually learned a lot of techniques that would have horrified any forester. <laughs> but nevertheless, they empowered themselves to be able to produce tree seedlings. And tree seedlings of trees that they could use, but also trees that were good as agroforestry trees. Because they were planting trees on the same land that they would plant their own crops. Some of them were, of course, planting trees where they also had coffee, or on the edge of trees on the edge of farms where they had tea, or along the road reserves, or around the compounds. The main focus in the beginning was that they would get firewood, they would get fencing material, they would get fodder for their animals, and they would get, uh, if they were fruit trees, they would get fruits. So they were meeting the basic needs of the women. They would hold the soil, they would protect their soil. They would also sometimes provide uh, not only fodder, but also uh, roughage to put in the sheds of their animals so that they could produce manure. They became very, very multi-purpose trees. And farmers are very good at that. They can tell which trees uh, are good for them. Sometimes, of course, they will tend to overplant the trees that they think are good for them. So they need constant reminder that we are looking for biodiversity and that we do not deal with the monocultures. So the, uh, one of the biggest challenges, therefore, that we faced was trying to convert these ordinary peasant women into foresters. And eventually they planted the trees, and the trees looked exactly like the trees that foresters plant. And so we came to the conclusion that these are foresters, but they don't have diplomas. <laughs> Now, the other challenge that we had was that in the course of our uh, planting, we realized that we needed to constantly inform these women. We, we needed to go beyond just the planting of trees. Why do they have to plant? For whom are they planting? What are the long-term uh, benefits of this planting? Now, it became necessary for us to hold seminars in order to pass this information. And when we started organizing seminars, we got ourselves into trouble with the government. Because the government at that time was very oppressive and did not allow people to come together and share information. There was a lot of restriction on the kind of information you pass and how you pass it. And the rule was, if you are more than nine, you cannot meet. But some families are more than nine. <laughs> so how can you ask <clears throat> for a license to meet as a family? So we decided that uh, we needed to hold these seminars. And we needed to challenge the rule that says you can't. So gradually, we realized that in order to do what we were trying to do, and in order to make it sustainable, we needed to have good governance. And good governance could not, was not being given by the government. We understood that good governance has to come through the pressure of citizens. And so we started empowering ourselves with information. And we had a very interesting series of seminars and in every seminar, we would have three sessions. The first session, we would say, what are the problems we face 
as a community. And we would list all the problems we face, and there were many. In one sitting, I remember we, we put down 150 problems. And I said, you got problems. <laughs> the next session was, where do you think these problems come from? And there we would really tax ourselves, trying to find out how all those problems came to be. And it was a very difficult but very essential session. Because this is a session where we realized that people needed to understand that many of the problems they had listed were of their own making. Even though the greatest culprit was the government. The government was constantly being blamed for everything that was wrong. And although the government was not our friend, and we were not trying to defend the government, it was very important for people to understand that if, for example, you have hunger, because you have allowed your piece of land to be degraded, because you have not been able to protect your soil, your topsoil, or because you do not want to harvest rainwater by creating trenches, or you have not planted perennial crops like bananas, like sugarcane, like yams, which you should eat during the harvest, between the harvest, which was the traditional method, if you don't do that, that has hardly anything to do with the government. That's you not able to manage your resource. If you are not eating properly and you are suffering and your children are suffering from diseases associated with malnutrition, because you have come to the conclusion that because you grow coffee or you grow tea and you have some cash income, you will not eat the food that the poor eat, that instead you will eat what you think affluent people eat, such as white rice, such as white unga, uh, white flour, wheat flour, or ugali, which comes from maize, which is refined, highly refined. There is not a, anything except carbohydrates in it. Or anything like tea, sugar, white sugar. You don't want to eat brown sugar because people who do take brown sugar are poor. They can't afford the white sugar. If you have that kind of mentality, that has hardly anything to do with the government. It is you who have allowed yourself to be persuaded that this is the way the affluent eat. But you yourself have never sat down with the affluent to eat, to know how they eat. You see them through the window or sometimes when you are cleaning their houses. So we needed for people to understand that the traditional foods, for example, are the foods that our bodies have evolved with and are adapted to. And that many of these foods are nutritious in a way. Some of these foods that we eat under the impression that we are affluent do to our bodies, they harm our bodies. They, we, we get diseases that we never got deep before. Diseases such as high blood pressure. Diseases such as diabetes. These were diseases that we didn't know about. But now they were becoming very prevalent. Now that has nothing to do with the government. So we started educating ourselves on the need for us to inform ourselves, to empower ourselves in order to do things for ourselves. And for me, it became very, very clear that for many of our people, especially because we have gone through uh, a colonial experience and have not yet been able to liberate ourselves from the colonial legacy, that a lot of the problems we have are of our own making. And when people come to help us, in form of aid, for example, sometimes we become so dependent on them that we completely lose the sense of self-reliance, which 
if, no matter what you do to people, if they are that disempowered, that they are not self-reliant, that they cannot think for themselves, that they cannot rise up and do things for themselves, you are wasting your time. In fact, you are contributing towards the problem. They need to be encouraged, empowered, to take their responsibility of their own lives into their own hands. The second aspect that we learned was that the government has a role, of course. It has to provide the leadership. And it has to, uh, to, do, to be a good custodian, especially of the resources that we so badly depend on. Because we are still relying very much on primary resources, on the soil, on the land, on forests, on water, straight from the river. So these resources need to be managed. But because they are commons, they have to be managed in a collective way by the government. That's the role we have given to the government. We did not give the government the role of enriching themselves you know, the people in the government, we did not tell them that they enrich themselves with the resources. If they do, they are being corrupt. And what we do when people are corrupt is that we vote them out the next time elections come by. So this process of empowering was extremely important. So the, the final session was usually, what do you think we can do? So we would list it down all the things we need to do. And we would say, maybe we need, to, uh, we need to protect our soils. We need to dig trenches on our farms. We need to um, plant trees was one of the most doable activities. But we also need to hold our governments accountable for the issues that they ought to take care of. And that's when eventually the movement became not only a, uh, an environmental movement, but a pro-democracy movement, and joined other pro-democracy movements to try to break the, uh, the, the closed society that had been created, especially during the administration of President Moy. And this was to last for 24 years, it was not until year 2002 that we eventually were able to remove that government, but it was due to these many years of trying to empower citizens so that they can take life, their own responsibilities, including holding their governments accountable, which is an extremely important part of our empowering this region. Now, we also, as a process, became very involved in advocacy issues. And some of you may have uh, heard about us in advocating for free space in cities, free open spaces, green spaces, protecting forests, protecting rivers, protecting watersheds, all these commons which, in many ways, were being privatized by the people in power. Some of you may remember the Uhuru Park was one of our celebrated uh, sites where we stopped the government building a 62-story skyscraper. And <clears throat> some of the arguments we had were, Nairobi, you can hardly get water on the fourth floor. <laughs> How will you get water on the 62nd floor? And we had been advocating even with the international community, to stop doing business, this kind of business, with our leaders. Because this was nothing but to promote one's ego. It wasn't going to do anything. And it, or it was going to be a conduit for siphoning resources that were intended to build it. And then it would be built, it would not be complete, it would never be used, it would probably be still standing there as a half-done building. But the resources, Will have been spent. And it is actions like that, as you know, that has put Africa in huge debt. Because people would, our leaders would come here or to any, to, would go to the World Bank, they would borrow money, they would come and have 
such white elephants, some of which never left the ground, and the money would be used. The money will have been borrowed in the name of the people, but development is not done, so people don't benefit. But it is the people who will eventually pay for those debts. As it is today, we are still paying those debts, some of which we are incurred by leaders whom we didn't want. We were trying to get rid of them. But some of them, we couldn't get rid of them because they were being supported by the same governments who are now telling us we owe them. Very, very unfair. That's why we are saying we need to educate people, especially in the developed countries where uh, we owe debt, to educate them that it is not as if Africans are being irresponsible, that they don't want to pay the debts. But one, we should remember that the circumstances under which these debts were incurred. And both sides, the lender and the borrower, were at fault. Secondly, these debts have been paid more than twice, sometimes more than three times. But we still can't cash up with them because of the way the structure, the interest rates were structured. So it's almost, it's almost as if they were structured to ensure that we would never stop paying. That's unfair, that's unjust, and that's why people are saying these debts are illegitimate. And it doesn't make sense to hold a person or to hold a people with such a rope around the neck and then on the other side you are giving them aid. It doesn't make sense. So we, we, we became advoc advocates of such issues because also because of such debts, the government was allowing, for example, illegal deforestation in order to make money, the government would literally allow its own people to die so that they could service the debts. Because if you don't service those debts, you will be in trouble with the developed countries and the World Bank. So children are allowed to die because there are no hospitals, there are no drugs, because we have to pay the debts. I think that this is something that uh, uh, really needs to be addressed very seriously, but as I say, Quite often, the whole story is not told. So people are given the impression that Africans just don't want to pay the debt. They are an irresponsible lot. They borrowed, but they don't want to pay. And of course, psychologically, you feel like, what kind of a person is that? If you borrow, you pay. That's the rule of the game. Yes, but do you really want to be paid a thousand times over? And it is for that reason that we had even uh, campaigned in the year 2000, I'm sure some of you were involved in the campaign to cancel those debts. In the year 2007, we said we come from Abrahamic, Abrahamic religion, and the Jews, every 50 years, they would say, it is time to celebrate. It's time for a jubilee. And at this time, we forgive all debts. We free the slaves. It is all there in the Bible if we believe that book. <laughs> I want to quickly let you know that one of the campaigns that we are involved in right now is a campaign to get rid of plastics for packaging. And this morning I saw a somebody pushing a campaign like that here in Britain and I was very impressed because it's, it's part of the consumer, consumer uh, mentality where in, in Kenya, uh, everything gets packed in very thin plastics. And they're so thin, you can only use them once. And when you go home, you tear them. You don't even open. You tear them and you throw them in the waste paper basket. And they end up in dump sites, in drainages, in, in, on trees, in the soil, even in stomachs of domestic animals. Those of you who have been to Kenya, it's an unsightly thing. So we have been trying to plead with the government to have these excess packages removed from the environment. And I am very pleased with uh, some governments have had our campaign and they have decided they will do something.
President Kagame of Rwanda woke up one morning and he said, I don't want to see a piece of plastic in this country. And he himself took up the bloom and started sweeping. And today, that country is as clean as possible, which is really, so you need leadership. This century, Tanzania did the same. You would think Kenya would be the first because we are doing the campaign from there. But you know, as usual, they are always the last. <laughs> we, were, we were doing that campaign. I went to Japan and I visited Japan and I was talking about that campaign. And I said, well, you know, in here in Japan, sometimes it's very difficult to be able to tell people who are affluent, like you, like the Japanese, like the Americans, how to practice that concept of reuse, reduce, recycle. Because it always sounds like you are telling people to reduce their quality of life. But I was very impressed because when I started talking about this, I was told by that in Japan, traditionally, they had a culture, uh, a traditional uh, Buddhist culture, where before they became so wealthy, they would take a gift and wrap it up in a piece of cloth, which they called furoshiki. And they would give you the gift, and you are supposed to return the furoshiki so that they can use it the next time. But once they became affluent, they forgot that concept. So when I started talking about that, they told me about it, and I said, that's exactly what I need to tell the Japanese. So I said, I'm here to tell you about furoshiki. <laughs> And the Minister for Environment was very good, and she um, immediately took up that idea and commissioned some companies to produce furoshiki. And, and the next time I went there, she gave me some furoshiki. She had actually created, she had been very creative. They are very creative, those Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> the minister had created this uh, envelope and had put there mutainai and here furoshiki. And if anybody who went into her office got this envelope. And in the envelope is a furoshiki. And I want to show you this furoshiki. And it is made from recycled plastics. So with the technology, you can do a lot. This, this is hardly something you can say that it is going to reduce your quality of life. So I thought that was uh, an excellent uh, idea, and I thought this is really what we should do, uh, especially those of us who live in countries like here where technology is uh, superb, and, and so you can really show the way. There are many examples that you can give in order to give people reasons to reuse, reduce, recycle without necessarily uh, uh, lowering their quality of life. The other one that I personally did was when I went into the government and I was made uh, a deputy minister, I went into the office and the first thing I noticed is that every letter we write, we only write on one side of the paper. And even if there is only the signature that jumps to the next page, it is put on a brand new piece of paper. So one time I found myself in a meeting like this, the whole cabinet and government was uh, talking on how we can be more efficient. So I, the president was there, so I said to the president, you know, Mr. President, I have a small idea. I think that the government should be printing on both sides of the paper. Because if we did, can you imagine the amount of money we would save and the number of trees we would save? Of course they laughed because they know I love trees. <laughs> but the next thing I saw was a circular for the entire government being instructed to always print on both sides of the paper. And now I hear people say in the government, they say, you have no idea how much money we have been able to save just by printing on both sides of the paper. I said, when we read books, we turn the page and we read on both sides. We never complain. How come with the letters, we always want another piece of paper? So there are many little things that we can do in our, ordinary, uh, in our ordinary life. You all know about uh, um, the um, Billion Tree ca campaign. And um, we s launched this Billion Tree campaign in, at UNEP during the Climate Change Conference 
in October. And one of the reasons why we launched it is really to bring a message to the world that the climate change is a serious business. And I'm very happy that at least now we are listening to the experts and the experts are telling us it's no longer maybe, perhaps, they are saying 90%. It's the activities that we humans are carrying out that are causing that problem. And with that, we can be persuaded to do something. Those of us in the tropics can plant a lot of trees, can save the studding trees. It is for that reason that I agreed to be the good ambassador for the Congo forest ecosystem. Because in my opinion, especially with the climate change, we need to help, we need to protect the trees that are standing, and especially the trees in our major forests, the Amazon, the Congo, and the South, Southeast Asia forests. We need them. They don't need us. We need them. And we can encourage our governments, we can encourage our, especially ministers of environment, to truly commit themselves to helping governments in that region to save these forests. The logging that is going on, both legal and illegal, is going on not because the pygmies who live in those forests want to make money, but because companies, most of them uh, located in uh, northern industrialized countries, are interested in the timber there. The, we need to raise our awareness so that it can become immoral for anybody to go there and log, take advantage, whether it is taking advantage of the corruption of the government or taking advantage of the ignorance, uh, or taking advantage of the inability to protect, but it ought to be a concern to all of us that those forests are protected. <coughs> this, is, this is a session where uh, many people say, where did you come from? How did you get inspired? Why did you start the Green Belt Movement? And that's the, that I think that one of the most important decisions that we have made in my life was a decision that was made by my mother and my brother. I have two brothers ahead of me, and they were both going to school. I was not going to school, but my elder brother asked my mother, why isn't Wangari going to school with us? And credit to my mother, she said, no good reason. She could have said, I need her to help me take care of my siblings, the other siblings, because that's the role of girls in Africa. I need her to fetch firewood. I need her to fetch water for me. She said, no good reason, why not? And so I was sent to school. So this is my first day to school. I said, my first day at the primary school, sticks with me. Actually, it is what happened before I got to school that is most vivid. I had a slate, you all know a slate, an exercise book and a pencil to write with, and a simple bag made from animal skin. Later on, my uncle gave me a cotton bag from the shop he owned. Although it would not have been unusual for a girl of eight to walk the three miles to, to school alone, my cousin, whose name was Jonathan, nicknamed Jono, came to pick me up and take me to school. He was a little older and could already read and write. As we walked barefoot along the dirt path up the hill to the clearing where the primary school stood, my cousin suddenly stopped and sat down at the side of the road. He beckoned me to do the same. Do you know how to read and write? He said, no, I don't, I replied. Can you write at least? He said, trying his best to intimidate me. I told him that I could not. I'm not even sure I knew what writing was really but I did not want to let out that much. Well, let me show you something, he said mysteriously. 
What's that? I asked, intrigued. Let me show you how to write. He took out his exercise book and wrote something on it with a crayon-like pencil which you had to lick in order to get, to get it to write. I don't know whether any of you remember those pencils. They were so difficult you had to... Uh. <laughs> Believe me, cousin Jono made the most of that lick. He then presented me with what he had written. Now, of course, I couldn't understand what he had scrawled on the page, but I was mightily impressed. Wow, so you can write, I said, my eyes widening. My cousin nodded and then did something I thought was miraculous. He took an eraser out of his bag and rubbed out what he had written. The writing simply disappeared. I had never seen an eraser before, and it seemed like magic. Can you do that, he asked me, with more than a touch of pride. No, I can't, I replied sadly, thinking my cousin was some kind of a genius. This is what you will learn in school, he said. And with that, we continued our journey. Now, I never forgot that day. It was a great motivation for me. How I longed to be able to write something and rub it out. <laughs> when I finally learned to read and write, I never stopped. Because I could read, I could write, and I could rub out. <laughs> Thank you very much. if you want to ask a question. We've got some roving mics. Professor Mathai, tomorrow I stand in front of a primary school full of children who are lucky enough to have the opportunity to read and write. I wonder if you could give me the message to give them tomorrow. I wonder what that would be. I'd like to tell this story to children. The stream in which I used to fetch water for my mother and how that stream was clean and um, was so clean that frogs would lay their eggs there. And that when I would visit that stream, I would find the frog eggs. And you all know how the frog eggs are connected. And I used to think they were beads. I didn't know they were frog eggs. And I would try to pick them up to put around my neck, to decorate my neck. And I, every time I would pick them up, they would break. And after some time, all the eggs would disappear. And instead, there would be thousands of wiggling tadpoles. And I would try to catch these tadpoles by their tails, which was virtually impossible. And then one day, all these would disappear. And I had no idea what was going on. I like to tell this story to children because I like for them to imagine how beautiful the environment can be and how that environment can disappear if we don't take care of it. I wanted to ask you, what would really help your world from, from our standpoint? What could we give you? I mean, is it the live aid? Is it the money? What could we give you that would help? I know that there is a lot of confusion sometimes on what does Africa need from the developed world. I think a lot of the images that Africa is presented with, both herself and on her behalf to the international world, is very disempowering because perhaps the press knows that they cannot sell the good images. People used to tell me, 
nothing, come, nothing good comes out of Africa. Everything, everything is, uh, that comes out of Africa is bad. And I used to say, well, I'm not bad. <laughs> and I come from Africa, I'm good news. <laughs> but I think that the governments in the developed world know exactly what they are doing to Africa. Governments know that those debts are illegitimate, those debts should be canceled. But they will not do that. Maybe the people of this part of the world should be asking their people, why not? How do you deal with people who oppose you? Presumably you have encountered some corrupt politicians who don't want you to succeed. And my second question is, you enjoy a very high profile now internationally. Um, how do you keep, manage your own ego? Thank you. <laughs> we cannot give up hope. And for the sake of our children and their children, we must continue to struggle. At least now, we will not have the powerful governments giving us excuses that science is not sure. At least science is now almost 100% sure. So we must put pressure on our governments to use, to do whatever is needed in order to reduce the damage that we are doing. But most of all, let us educate each other and let us do even the little things we can do. What do I do with my ego? Fortunately, I'm not perfect. I just thought I would love to take that woman back to my school. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah. I mean, what an inspiration that yeah. would be. I mean, I, I was sitting there thinking, this is such a privilege for me. I would just love my children to see this and, and also some of the teachers in the school. Yeah, I thought that as well about, you know, if you could inspire staff, uh, t fellow teachers with some, somebody like that coming to speak to them or getting that message across about, because um, we've been talking recently about having a sustainable school and right. all of that entails you know energy saving not wasting things getting the kids to recycle stuff and not chuck it all on the floor and um you know that that message she gave was just really powerful mm. wasn't it yeah, she was so warm and enthusiastic in the way that she was speaking about all yeah, that she'd done. Yeah. And uh, it kind of made you think, oh, what could I be doing and what could we be doing at our school? Because I was, I, was, I was thinking differently. I was, we, we're looking at like, our carbon footprint and we're, we've approached businesses to offset their carbon using our school. So it's all these exciting projects. And I was just thinking, I wonder whether it's running before we can walk. Carbon, carbon footprints and offsetting carbon mm. emissions is quite like out there, isn't exactly. it? You know, and it's what sort of governments are, are wheeling and dealing over, and big sort of multinationals are wheeling and dealing over. It's perhaps, I think maybe for our school, we'd need to start <laughs> a little bit sort of at the grassroots level before we got to that level. But in in saying that, it's still worth having a global picture of these things as well, isn't it? Because what she was referring to was the, you know, we all belong to the human family and mm. we all share the earth. And unless we all take responsibility and all look after it, it's not like you can blame other people. You, we all have a role to play. I'm sure when I go back to school, I'll be doing an assembly um, using Wangari's, uh, you know, enthusiasm to spark something off and get people thinking about how they can make a difference in the environment. And from a religious studies perspective, um, quite often we only study people who are dead and quite often they're male. So I think it would be quite good to have somebody mm. who's actually alive and female to um, look at as somebody who's made a difference.